afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you back to my lectures. Hope you had a nice time uh, studying and reading on ectopic pregnancy. Uh, for those that would, would like to revise that, that lecture, I've already uploaded it on the channel. Uh, you can go back to it and revise it. For today, I was told to some of the students are requested that I make a presentation on uh, labor. But before we talk about labor, it's very important that we discuss the physiology of labor itself. Because once we understand the whole physiology of labor, we'll be able to understand what labor is. Okay? So this is what we need to understand today. So I said, uh, let me start with the physiology of labor. And once I'm done with that, uh, then the next topic will be labor. So I will come you back. Let's see whether you can enjoy this lecture also. So now, when we are talking about labor, uh, there are two uh, terminologies that people uh, usually want to understand. There is what, what we call labor and the Z, this terminology which I've just uploaded here on this slide, which is parturition. Okay? These two can be used interchangeably, but uh, they've got slight differences in them, okay? Because when we talk about labor itself, we are simply talking about the whole process that results into the expulsion of the fetus. That one we'll discuss it on, the, on another day. But while when we talk about parturition, it starts earlier compared to labor, okay? It starts a little bit earlier. Okay, but it, both of them, they simply mean the process of bringing forth a young one, okay? But with parturition, it is starting a little bit early. That's why we are able to notice some of the transformations that will be occurring in both the uterus and on the cervix. So these transformations that occur on the uterus and the cervix, these are what we'll be discussing today. How is the uterus able to accommodate this fetus? What are some of the activities that the uterus and the cervix have to undergo in order to accommodate this fetus? This is what we'll be discussing today. That is the physiology of labor. Okay? So, now... Uh, there's a question which is normally asked, okay? They will ask you during your OSCEs or even during your ward rounds, wherever you're going to be, they may ask you a question. Is a uterine muscle an excitable tissue or a non-excitable tissue? Okay? Is it excitable or non-excitable? We say, uh, since uh, a lot of, this, since this is not a live lecture, we usually say a, a, a nerve tissue is excitable because it is able to undergo what we call an action potential. So is the uterine muscle able to do that? Yes. That's why we say a uterine muscle is an excitable tissue. A uterine muscle is an excitable tissue because it can undergo an action potential. That's the first point there on that slide. The uterus is spontaneously active. Why do we say it is active? Because it can undergo an action potential. Okay? Now, just on this slide, I want you to come here on this picture. Okay? So, when you look at a smooth a uterine muscle, it's simply a group of a lot of smooth muscles that come together to form this uterine muscle. And these smooth muscles, if you see, this is a smooth muscle. And, sorry, sorry, sorry for that. If you see, this is a smooth muscle. This is also a smooth muscle. This is a smooth muscle. All these smooth muscles are interconnected via what we call these here. These connections, we call them gap junctions. Okay? So this smooth muscle, once this smooth muscle is excited, 
it will quickly send some of the impulses to other smooth muscles via these gates, which we call gap junctions. So these smooth muscles, they come together, they are interconnected via gap junctions to form this uterine muscle. Okay? So now, just like the heart, okay? When we go to the heart, the waves of depolarization will start from the sinoatrial node and they will be spread everywhere to there in the heart. And then the heart will undergo contractions. Okay? So, what do I mean? The uterine muscle is also made up of a peacemaker where depolarization starts. Okay? Just like in the heart, waves will start from where? From the sinoatrial node. They will start from the sinoatrial node coming down. Just the same with the uterus. When you are asked, where uh, is the peacemaker of the uterus located? Many people will say it is in the fundus. No, it's not in the fundus. It is believed that the peacemakers of the heart, they are just at the intersection, at the junction between the fallopian tube and the uterus. Immediate where the fallopian tube starts, Inside the uh, inside the uterus is where they usually start, where, where you say the corneum. Somewhere around that area, that's where we find the peacemakers of the uterus. So when waves of so waves of depolarization will start from those areas, and then they will come to the fundus and then spread everywhere down. And then you're going to have a contraction. That's what normally occurs. Okay? So now then the trigger, some of the things that would trigger these uh, peacemakers, these peacemakers to bring about contraction, some of the triggers are not well understood. But what is understood is that some of the hormonal changes and also some mechanical changes would result into activation of these sinoatrial nodes of the uterus, if I was to put it like that. They would result into these sinoatrial nodes of the uterus to bring about waves of depolarization as a result, causing the whole uterine mass muscle to contract. Okay, So some of the hormonal changes and mechanical changes would result into a depolarization of the uterus, which will cause uterine contractions. Okay, so now let us look at some of these hormonal changes and mechanical changes that would result into these kinds of effects. So let us look at some of the hormonal and mechanical changes. So now, there are a lot of hormones which are associated with labor. There are a lot of hormones, okay? But those which are specific for the uterine muscle, because right now we are looking at the physiology of the uterine muscle and the cervix. So some the most important hormones that you should know that have to do with the uterine muscle is estrogen and progesterone. Okay, one of them will tell the uterus to contract, or the other one will tell the uterus not to contract. So one of them likes uterus contracting, the other one doesn't like the uterus to contract. Okay, so if you look at the, the slides here, progesterone inhibits uterine contractions, while estrogen, on the other hand, causes uh, it stimulates uh, uterine contractions. So one of them brings about contractions, while the other ones inhibit contractions. So in the early phases of pregnancy, which one would you want to have more compared to the other? It's progesterone, because you want to keep that pregnancy. If estrogen is more than progesterone, what will, they, what will happen is that it will bring about what? Uterine contractions. As a result, the baby will expel. So you want more progesterone, compared to estrogen. Mm. Well, now, when you move from the first and second trimester, when you enter into the third trimester, around the seventh month, 
what is happening is that you are going to have more production of estrogen while progesterone production will remain constant. Okay. Uh, progesterone will remain constant. The production will remain the same, constant, while estrogen progesterone will start to increase as you are heading towards the end of pregnancy. Estrogen levels will start to increase while progesterone levels will remain constant in production. They will be produced in the same quantity. So what is happening in the third trimester is that you are going to have more estrogen compared to progesterone. So which means the estrogen to progesterone ratio will be what? Will be increased. So this is just a graph showing you what would happen. Let's say this is at the time of ovulation, you had coitus, and then uh, you conceived, okay? So you have conceived here. This graph is showing you, uh, where is my case? It's showing you that once you conceive, what is happening? Progesterone levels will start to increase compared to estrogen levels. This is estrogen, this blue line. So progesterone levels will start to increase in number, suppressing the function of estrogen. So if estrogen is more than progesterone, what will happen? Someone will start having contractions and then they may end up having miscarriages. They may end up having abortions. So what we want is more progesterone compared to what? To estrogen. And as you can see, as estrogen is being increased, it is being beefed up by what? The human chorionic gonadotrophin until somewhere around the 20th week. So you have more inhibitors of contractions compared to what? To stimulators of contractions. Okay? This is what is happening in the early phases. Now when you reach somewhere in the second, in the third trimester, somewhere 28, 28 weeks, when you reach somewhere around the 28th week, you see estrogen level starts to increase compared to progesterone. Estrogen levels will kickstart. They will increase in number. When they increase in number, what is happening is that they bring about contractions. Somebody will start having some Braxton Hikes contractions and then somebody will be saying, no, no, no. Uh, somebody will make a diagnosis of UTI or you know, patient will come complaining of low abdominal pain and then you say, oh, this patient has got a UTI. Wow, well, you didn't do a urine analysis. Even when you do a urine analysis, it's negative for leukocytes. You still say UTI because you don't know what is happening. So it is very important to understand the physiology of parturition. In the third trimester, we expect estrogen levels to start increasing in number. As a result, what does estrogen stimulate? It brings about contractions. Here and there, the patient will be having contractions. As a result, what will happen is that at the end of the day, what will happen is that you are going to have irregular contractions. They will now form into these regular contractions and then that's when now you say this patient has entered into labor and then you are going to expel the fetus. Okay? So this is some, these are the two hormones that I would like you to understand because they are very important when you are dealing with the pregnancy. Okay. So now, after we have understood that estrogen brings about contractions and progesterone inhibits contractions, now let us dig deeper into these two hormones. Okay? How is progesterone able to inhibit uterine contractions? And how is estrogen able to stimulate uterine contractions? Okay? So number one, if you look at the slide there, we are now at the cell, at the cellular level. Many people usually call it the cellular level. We are at the cell now. What is progesterone doing at the cell? It is that it is inhibiting the gap junctions. Remember that slide that I showed you, even this one. Lucky enough, this one, you see? You look at these. Look at these here. These. These that I'm putting with the case. These are what we call gap junctions. Okay? So if this smooth muscle has been activated, it wants to contract. If these gap junctions are open, it can easily transmit some of the impulse into the other smooth muscle and causing these other smooth muscles to do what? To contract. Okay? So what is progesterone doing is that it is closing these gap junctions. 
it is inhibiting them, closing them down. So even though this smooth muscle has been activated, these other smooth muscles will not be activated. As a result, there will be no uterine contraction. You see the beauty of progesterone. Okay? The other thing is that progesterone will inhibit oxytocin receptors. It cannot control the production of oxytocin in the paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus of the brain. It cannot control their productions, but it can control what that oxytocin is going to do on the uterine muscle. So what progesterone does is that, what does it do? It closes the receptors for oxytocin. So no matter how much the brain is producing oxytocin, if that oxytocin comes to the uterus, it will have no receptors to bind to and bring about uterine contractions. As a result, there will be no what? Contraction. So, progesterone is keeping the uterus quiet. What I mean is that there is no contractions. It is keeping the uterus quiet by number one, blocking the gap junctions. Number two, it is decreasing or it is inhibiting uh, oxytocin receptors. And then number three, right here on the uterine muscle, there are also prostaglandin receptors, okay? Right on the uterine muscle, uh, there are also uh, prostaglandin receptors, okay? Now, what we need to understand is that there are some prostaglandins which usually cause uterine relaxation, and there are some prostaglandins which cause uterine contractions, okay? For example, uh, prostocycline, PGI2. Prostocycline, PGI2, usually causes uterine relaxation. While, prosto, uh, while prostocycline, uh, while PGF2-alpha and also uh, PGE2 would cause what? Uterine contractions. So, which of these uh, prostaglandins is the, 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 the we, is oxytocin more interested in stimulating? It will stimulate prosto, prostocycline I2 because I2 will cause the uterine relaxation while prostaglandin F2 alpha and the, uh, and the E2 will be inhibited by progesterone. As a result, there will be no contractions. These two, they will cause contractions. While the I2 will not cause contraction, it will cause relaxation. So prosto, uh, progesterone, so progesterone, what will it do? It will say, oh, I'm fine. Uh, I would like uh, to have more I2 for uterine rel relaxation so that the uterus does not contract. And I would like to inhibit the production uh, of Prosto, uh, of PGF2 alpha and also E2. As a result, there will be no contractions. Number four, what does progesterone do? Is that it is it is making the cell. Remember that I say the smooth muscle. It is uh, it can it it uh, it can undergo an action potential. Yeah. I said it is excitable because it is able to undergo an action potential. Remember what I just said, right? It is excitable because it can undergo an action potential. So now, remember when a cell, if I take you back to physiology, when a cell is at rest, it's at minus 90. When it reaches minus 60, we say it is at threshold potential. After you move up, we say it will now start undergoing depolarization, which is an action potential. Now, look at what progesterone is doing. Is that progesterone is making the membranes of the cell more electronegative. It is making this cell more electronegative. So it is far away from a threshold potential and far away from eliciting an action potential. You see the beauty of progesterone. Okay? So it is making the cell more electronegative to prevent the cell from undergoing an action potential. Because when it undergoes an action potential, it is going to bring about contractions. So that's what progesterone is doing. 
While estrogen, on the other hand, does the opposite. What does estrogen do? It will, do you remember that as pregnancy increases, when you enter the third trimester, you start having more estrogen compared to progesterone. So as estrogen levels are increasing in number, what is happening? These estrogen levels will start now opening up and activating gap junctions, they'll be opening up gap junctions, so that if one smooth muscle is excitable, it can easily spread the excitability. Mm, that's a nice English. It can easily spread the excitability to other smooth muscles and bring about uterine contractions. That's what it will be doing. Number two is that estrogen causes oxytocin receptors to be activated. So as the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus of the brains are producing oxytocin, this oxytocin is coming down to the uterus and it finds its receptors open because there's so much estrogen. Estrogen will activate the receptors for oxytocin and oxytocin will, oh no, what does oxytocin do? It causes uterine what? Contraction. So oxytocin will bring about uterine contraction. So this is what estrogen is doing. Number three is that right there at the local receptors, uh, the uterus, right there locally at the uterus, they are what we call prostoglandin receptors. Estrogen will activate the prostoglandins that bring about contractions, EGF2 alpha and E2, and then it will inhibit I2, which brings about relaxation. As a result, what will happen is that when prostaglandin, when PGF2 alpha and I2 they bind their receptors. What will they bring about? They will bring about uterine contraction. So these are the two hormones that you should understand. Uh, after understanding this now, mm, we, it, is, it is good to understand a little bit about the oxytocin. Okay? Oxytocin, as I said, it is a peptide hormone. I said it is produced in the brain, in the hypothalamus. And the two nucleus which we usually produce is the supraoptic and the, and the paraventricular nuclear. And once, once you reach, uh, let's say you've got remaining three weeks into labor, you are going to have, there will be this dramatic increase of oxytocin receptors due to estrogen. Remember, right? Estrogen will cause uh, a dramatic increase in oxytocin receptors by almost 200 folds. And what does oxytocin do? Hmm? Directly, it can bind to its receptors and bring about uterine contractions. While indirectly, it can also stimulate prostaglandin receptors, pro prostaglandin production. Yeah. You see what it is doing? It is causing the production of those prostaglandins which bring about uterine contractions. So that's what oxytocin would do. And as a result, what are you going to have? Contractions. Okay, so that is east on prostaglandin, uh, oxytocin, and then on prostaglandin itself. I already talked about it. Okay, this one, these, these hormones are usually produced locally. Okay, mostly they are produced locally, and what do they do? If they direct, they can bind to their receptors and bring about what contractions. Okay, they can upregulate. Uh, myometrial gap junctions so which means they increase the number of gap junctions and we know that once there are more gap junctions interconnecting the smooth muscles to other smooth muscles which means impulses would easily flow through and bring about a uterine contraction and then indirectly they can upregulate the oxytocin receptors this is what they are doing Indirectly, they are increasing oxytocin receptors so that when oxytocin has been produced by the hypothalamus via the posterior pituitary into the bloodstream, it comes to the uterus, brings about uterine contractions. It will find its receptors open and then it will bring about what? Uterine contractions. So these are the hormones that you should be able to understand when you are dealing with pregnancy. Okay? These hormones, you need to understand how they work and you need to understand what intervention you should, you should take in case they are easy, in case there are early signs of labor. Because if the fetus is 600 grams, somebody is having contractions, you better do something.
You have to do something. Because you now understand that, okay, what could be bringing this is increase in estrogen. What should I do? Let me give progesterone to counteract the functions of what? Of estrogen. And then we know what estrogen, what progesterone will do is that it will do what? It will inhibit all those receptors. It will in inhibit the gap junctions. It will make the cell more electronegative. As a result, the cell will become quiet again. And when the cell is quiet, there are no what? Contractions. All right? So let's go on. Okay, now let us look at some of the mechanical changes. Okay? So now, we said the trigger is unknown. That would bring about uterine contractions. Okay? But we have, we've got some uh, evidence that shows that some hormones, e.g., an increase in estrogen, would bring about what contractions. Okay, now if any mechanical, some mechanical factors would result into contraction. Okay, when a muscle is stretched, it always what contracts. A muscle is stretched, it does what it usually contracts. Okay, so. Mechanical changes have to do with stretch of the uterine muscle and also the cervix. Okay. When a uterine muscle is stretched, what is happening? Look at the slide. When the uterine muscle is stretched, what is happening? There will be increased increase in contractions. Okay. When it is stretched, it will result in what? Increase in contractions. What are some of the things that would result into the stretch of this uterine muscle? It could be fetal movements. As the fetus is kicking, the mother will be saying, me, whenever the fetus is kicking, I usually feel a lot of abdominal pain. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It is a good and a bad thing. The good thing is that as the uterus is moving, it is stretching the, the uterine muscles and causing contraction. Telling the mother that it is alive. But in the process, again, if they kick so much, it can bring about contractions and then result into early labor okay the other thing is that what are some of the other things that would cause a stretch in the uterine muscle it could be what uh, multiple pregnancies you've got it. multiple pregnancies that's why let's say you have got triplets somebody would ask me why is it that triplets when somebody has got triplets they usually go into early labor they go into early labor because of these mechanical changes. When you've got triplets, which means the muscle is being, uh, is being stretched so much that it, it wants to contract. And as when it contracts, somebody will go into early labor. That's why most triplets by 33, 32, 34 weeks, somebody will be in labor because the uterine muscle has been overstretched. And when the uterine muscle has been stretched, there's... Uh, a likelihood of an increase in contractions. Okay? Big babies, polyhydrominous, all those things, they cause so much stretch in the uterus and they can result into uh, uterine contractions. And they can result into uterine contraction. That's why we need to understand these things as we are, uh, as we are discussing so that you people can be able to articulate these things, you can be able to interpret these things, and you can be able uh, to manage your patients properly. Mm? It is very embarrassing to give your patients antibiotics when they don't need them. Mm? Just the baby is moving around, the patient complains of abdominal pains, you're already writing UTI, and you're already giving your patients antibiotics. I have seen this happening. That's why I'm just saying it. That's why I had to do this lecture before I talk about labor. Okay? You haven't even done a urine analysis to confirm your UTIs, and yet you are giving antibiotics as if they are sweets. It's very embarrassing. So, we need to understand the physiology that would result into some of these pains, these lower abdominal pains these females usually have, and how we would control them. Okay? Now, when the uterus is contracting, the cervix also what? Also, uh, also dilates. Okay? It also stretches as the fetal head is pressing, coming out of the cervix, the cervix will also dilate. 
And when the cervix dilates, the stretch in the cervix, there's also what there is also a, a possibility of an increase in what in contraction. There could be a positive feedback to the brain, causing it to produce more oxytocin. Oxytocin comes to the receptor, to the receptors, and causes more contractions. Even when you sweep your cervix or membrane, you call it membrane sweeping. Mm. When you sweep the cervix, you are stretching the cervix. Even when when you are inducing labor, you put a balloon catheter. You, you are stretching the cervix. When you stretch the cervix, we say if they stretch in the cervix and stretch in the uterus, there is a likelihood that this patient would undergo contractions. Okay? And some of the things that would cause the stretch in the cervix, we have already mentioned them. So those are some of the mechanical and uh, hormonal changes that would result into uterine contraction or prevent uterine contractions. So now, after understanding uh, these hormones, after understanding these hormones, now we can now talk about uh, the phases of myometrial activity. Okay, this is where now we are talking about the physiology. We have talked about the hormones which are responsible in this uh, in in this lecture. We have talked about the hom the hormones uh, responsible in the physiology of labor. Now we need to see some of the activities that the myometria, which is the muscular part of the uterus, has to undergo in order to ensure that the, the fetus grows well and at the right time, the, the fetus is expelled via the cervical vaginal canal. We need to look at some of the activities that the uterine muscle usually undergoes. Okay, these are what we call phases of myometrial activity. Okay, so now from the time of conception until the initiation of parturition, we are simply still talking about the first two trimesters. Okay, here we are simply talking about the first two trimesters. So from the time you conceive until the beginning of the third trimester. We expect the uterus to be quiet. Okay? We expect the uterus to be what? To be quiet. That's what we call the phase of quiescence. We expect the uterus to be what? Quiet. What is making the uterus quiet is progesterone. Okay? We expect the uterus to be quiet because there is more progesterone. And then we have already said what is what progesterone is doing. We have said that progesterone is doing what? It is inhibiting the gap junctions. Mm -hmm. It is inhibiting oxytocin receptors and prostaglandin receptors. It is making the cell more electronegative. As a result, this cell is far away from contracting. In fact, it is sleeping, allowing the baby to grow. These two phases, this is to allow the baby to do it, to grow. Okay? That's what will, that will, what will be happening. And then... That's what we call the phase of quiescence. Now, once parturition has been initiated, once you enter into the third trimester, that's when parturition is initiated. This is where I was talking about false and true parturition or false and true labor. Okay, false labor where you have Braxton Heights contractions. Okay, estrogen. So, so now active. We have activation phase of myometrial activity uh, I think we were cut out due to internet we are back welcome back to the lecture so now let's go through the phases of myometrial activity we have talked about the first phase the first phase of myometrial activity which is known as the phase of quiescence others they will call it phase zero other books would call it phase one. So the first phase is the phase of quiescence where the uterus is quiet. And we have said what makes the uterus quiet is progesterone. Okay. Uh, just hold on. Let me put this here. Okay. So what is keeping the uterus quiet is progesterone. And then uh, once now you enter into the second phase of parturition, which begins with initiation of parturition, 
okay the second phase of labor which begins with initiation of parturition it begins right in the third trimester okay or somewhere 28 28 weeks this is when the uh the activation phase begins here what is happening is that estrogen levels will start to increase in number compared to progesterone progesterone levels will remain constant in production while estrogen levels will be increasing in number so what is happening is that the estrogen to progesterone level to progesterone ratio is going to be increased as a result what is happening is that now is that the uterus which was quiet it's being awakened up it's wake is it's waking up right somebody was sleeping you are waking them up okay so this is the uterus which was quiet relaxed okay now somebody is holding holding trying to wake him up now it starts to wake up this is what we call the activation phase of parturition okay so what is happening here what is happening here is that estrogen is stimulating this so when estrogen starts to increase in number what is happening to the oxytocin receptors they increase in number what is happening to the gap junctions they start to be in, they start to increase what is happening to the prostaglandin receptors they are also being activated okay and then it is you now it during this phase this is what is this is what usually occurs during this phase this is what usually occurs you have now the uterus which was quiet it is now being activated okay so this phase is from initiation of parturition from somewhere 28 weeks until onset of labor okay this is from initiation of parturition until onset of labor okay now somebody would ask now what usually what usually brings about onset of labor but we'll not discuss we'll discuss that later okay so in phase two or what we call the activation phase of parturition this is where now we also have what we call a cervical ripening okay this is where we have also what we call a cervical ripening okay this is look at look at during this phase look at how tight uh, the five fibers uh, how, how tight they were and look at how loose they are here due to uh, look at how they how they are very loose this side showing you that now the cervix is starting to do it to ripen up okay so in phase two which is known as the activation phase or in other books they will say phase one because they start from phase zero this is where we start happening we start having a ripening of the cervix ripening of the cervix doesn't occur when labor begins no ripening of the cervix starts earlier okay this is where now you have got ripening of the cervix now phase three or other books will say phase two if you are starting from phase zero phase three is what we call the stimulation phase of labor or the stimulation phase of parturition so now this is where this begins with onset of labor until you deliver the placenta until you, you deliver the placenta from onset of labor until you deliver the placenta we call this the stimulation phase of parturition as you can see on the slides there it occurs in the last two to three gestational weeks okay so it is characterized by what uterine contractions so this is where you are having the braxton hikes kind of contraction the irregular contractions now the contractions are becoming more and more regular it is also characterized by what cervical dilatation it is also characterized by what fetal and placenta expulsion okay this is what we call the stimulation phase of parturition okay it occurs in the last three two to three weeks of gestation so it can occur at 40 it can occur in the last two weeks of gestation at the 38 to 40 weeks sometimes it can occur between 37 to 40 weeks others who have got post dates or post term pregnancy it can occur somewhere between 39 to 41 or somewhere between uh, 38 to 41 so you are the, this phase usually occurs 
it occurs uh, in the last two to three weeks of uh, gestation. Okay, so now what stimulates this is the synthesis of uterotonics. Is the synthesis is the synthesis of what uterotonics. Those who are being produced locally, which we are calling the prostaglandins, they are produced locally on the uterus, and then there are those which are produced in the brain. Okay, they are produced in the hypothalamus. They come down, and then they start bringing, making the irregular contractions into what regular contractions. Now, during this phase, somebody would ask now. What usually initiates labor? So, what it is believed, okay, that what initiates labor is the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis, as it has been studied in animals, not yet studied in human beings, okay? So, in animals, it has been studied that the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis is what stimulates labor, okay? So what happens is that the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis produces CRH and it also produces SCTH, okay, adenocorticotrophic hormones and corticotrophic releasing hormones. So these two hormones they will be released by the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis. And then these two hormones, they go into the fetal adrenal glands and causes them to produce cortisol and DHEAS, hmm? dihydroepialdosterone sulfate. Okay. These now, they go into the placenta. Okay. Inside the placenta there, they will cause the production of prostaglandins and estrogens. These prostaglandins and estrogen will then be transported into the maternal uterus. And remember, the prostaglandins that we are talking about is PGF2 alpha and the E2. And also, we are saying estrogen. Estrogen, what will happen? Estrogen will increase the what? The receptors for prostaglandins. Yes. It will increase receptors for prostaglandins. It will activate gap junctions. Yes. It will make the cell more electropositive. Yes. And then as a result, you are going to have what? Uterine contractions. So it starts all the way from the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis to the adrenal glands of the fetus. Then the fetus produces these two guys, the steroids. And then these two steroids, they go into the uterus and cause what? And cause the release of prostaglandins, estrogen. Okay? And then what do this, this uh, what will happen is that you're going to have now a decidual transcription of PG, F2 alpha, gap junctions, oxytocin, and then you're going to have an increase in sensitivity of the uterus. The uterus will be so stimulated that it will now start, you are, the, 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 that you are going to have now contractions, hence resulting into expulsion of the fetus. So you are going to have the, uh, the, the endocrine and the paracrine functions all contributing towards the what? The expulsion or the fetus, including autocrine functions. So you're going to have endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine function all contributing into converting irregular contractions to regular contractions as a result causing expulsion of the fetus and its membranes. Okay? So all this comes from where? The fetus. If the fetus delays, if the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis Delays to bring about these sudden changes, somebody will go into what we call post-term pregnancy. If the fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis does it too early, somebody will go into what we call a preterm labor. And then you can also have labor dystocia if this whole process does not occur in the right manner. Okay? So it is very important to understand the physiology 
of parturition, as or, or you can call it the physiology of labor, as it will be able, as it will help us understand how to manage these patients. Okay? So now, I've already talked about uh, some of the complications that could re result from uh, if that process does not go in the, in the normal way. So here is a question for you guys. Okay? Which one of the mediators of labor do we already manipulate in an attempt to prevent preterm labor? We have talked about which two hormones, oxytocin and the progesterone. Those are the mediators that we are talking about here. Which of these mediators do we manipulate to prevent recurrent preterm labor? In order to prevent recurrent preterm labor, as you can see, our answer is that studies have demonstrated that weekly injection of 25 of 250 micrograms of 17 hydroxyl progesterone, uh, which can be given between 16 weeks uh, to 36 weeks of gestation, reduces the risk of recurrent preterm labor. Somebody comes at 28 weeks having Braxton Hicks contraction. We have said 17 hydroxyl progesterone, you can give it between 16 to 36 weeks. So now you, you go and say it's a UTI instead of giving progesterone. What is happening? Are, your patient is going to expel. Okay? It's going to expel. So we need to give them, we need to give them a hydroxyl progesterone so that it reduces the risks of recurrent preterm labor. And what did we say about progesterone? We already said that progesterone inhibits, uh, we already said that progesterone uh, inhibits the formation of oxytocin receptors. It inhibits prostaglandin receptors. It closes gap junctions. All these have been stated for you here. So it is very important to understand these mediators as they will help us in managing our patients who come in pregnant to our facilities. So now, I said there were four phases, right? So we have talked about the three phases. So let's say now you have expelled the fetus, okay? The fetus has been expelled, the, uh, the placenta has been expelled, you have managed your third stage of labor properly. Now the uterus has to go back to its normal anatomical position. That process, that phase, we call it the evolution phase of labor. Okay? So we have talked about three phases, four phases. We have talked about the phase of quiescence, the activation phase, stimulation phase, and then now the evolution phase, which is from delivery, okay, to fertility restoration, to fertility restoration, okay? So, what is helping us is usually oxytocin, okay? As the baby is breastfeeding, the mother is producing oxytocin. Some of it is going to the breast and causes ejection of milk. While well, some of it will go to the uterus and bring about the evolution of the uterus, bring and contract the uterus to bring it to its normal position. That's why sometimes when a baby is breastfeeding, they will tell you, no, me, I don't like breastfeeding my baby because whenever my baby is breastfeeding, I usually have lower abdominal pains. That's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Because the uterus is going back to its normal position. Because if the uterus does not contract and go back to its normal position, this patient will end up bleeding and you will call that postpartum what? Hemorrhage. Somebody will go into what we call postpartum hemorrhage. So you, are, you, you need to encourage your patient that the, even though she's having those abdominal pains, it is very good for her healthy because the uterus is evoluting, going back to its normal position so that now the her fertility can be restored. Okay? So this evolution phase occurs from delivery. Once delivery has been completed until six weeks post pattern. Okay? This is when this whole physiology usually occurs. So I put this diagram just to help with the uh, explanation. 
it, though it didn't come out well. So uh, these are some of the mediators that we need to understand. These are the mediators we need to understand. Okay, in the first stage of labor, in the first stage, which is quiescence, you are going to have more of these. Second stage, you are going to have more of these. Third stage, you are going to have more of these. And then the final phase, you are going to have more of these to help in all the phases. Anyway, I hope everyone understood the lecture. And I hope everyone has learned one or two things from it. Uh, in case you like the content, feel, feel, feel free to subscribe to the channel. And also to give me a thumbs up so that we can be encouraged to provide more and more lectures for you people.